Shabbat Shalom and welcome to the Book of Acts Now Global Church and Global School. We are here praising the King of Kings today. He is Lord of Lords. He is all in all. He is great and mighty, and we call in His works to be done today. It be done in His name, in the name of Yeshua. Amen, amen. What a mighty God we serve. Hallelujah. He is all powerful. He is all great. He's almighty. Hallelujah. In Genesis chapter or Exodus chapter nine, Exodus chapter nine, one of the plagues began to fall. It was hail mixed with thunder and fire. It began to fall. It killed every man in the field. It killed every beast in the field. It broke every tree. It did great works of destruction. And finally, Pharaoh said, called Moses and Aaron and said, "Come and just call the just call this off." And Moses, what did he tell him? Moses told him, says, I'm going to walk out of the city, and when I get out of the city, I'll raise my hands and it will stop. Church, he walked through the hail, the thunder, thunder and fire. It did have no effect on him. And then it stopped, and when he said it was to stop. Church, I'm asking you today, I'm challenging you today, church. When are you going to step up and do the works that Yahweh has called you to do? We have got to be a His church that is the greatest power on this earth today. It's greater than any secret society. It's greater than any government. All the governments are corrupt in this world. Anybody can tell that. It doesn't matter if you like one or the other better. All governments are corrupt. We can see the things that's happening in our country today. But we need to stand up, church. We need to do the works that He called us to do. We've got to go forth in the power and in the name of Yahshua and see great and mighty works because he's, he's wanting to do these today. We've got to let them, his works be done. He's going to do them through his people. He's going to do them according to his word. We've got to get his word in our hearts, in our minds, and let it speak forth. Don't be led and be kept uh, out, and out of the work and hiding by the Satan because of the lies that is going on. Don't worry about what's going to happen. We know it's going to happen. Some of the, seven of the same plagues is going to hit in these last days. But we have got to be strong. We are in the power and the mighty name of Yeshua. We're in his Hebrew teachings. We're in his Hebrew names. Hallelujah. So we need to get back to those roots that is in his word. Come and realize that you've got to arise, church. Do the works that you are called to do. Let's go forth in power and demonstration of His Spirit. Hallelujah. Praise His name. I am just I just feel the power of God working today. Hallelujah. So let that power, that word, that anointing, that spirit get into your heart, your mind, your soul, and get in your body and start doing the works that you were called to do. Get with the commander-in-chief of heaven. Hallelujah. He is our commander-in-chief, and see what he wants you to do. He'll lead you and guide you. He'll take you all the way, no matter what the devil tries to do. Hallelujah. So praise him for his word. And today, Dr. Jerry Bowers is coming with the precious holy word of Yahweh to tell us and show us more plainly his way. Receive what he has today, and let's see the glory of God be made manifest in these last days, because he is going to do it. Amen, amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Shabbat shalom. We'll begin with a word of prayer um, and take a look at where we're at right now uh, in terms of God's calendar and what's happening in the world and what God is seeing from his vantage point. Heavenly Father, bless us today as we open your word, as we declare your heart. We ask, Father God, that you'll send your Ruach, your Holy Spirit, just come and hover in our midst and among those who are watching uh, the presentation today. Thank you for your strength and grace. In Christ's name, amen. So we've just completed the season of Pentecost. What happened uh, in the book of Acts when they completed Pentecost? Well, the first thing they did after the Holy Spirit fell and they ministered to folks who came, 3,000 came to the Lord. They went into their city. 
and they began to make him known. Amen. If we look into the streets of our city, what do we see this week? You know, let's be honest. We, we see lawlessness. We see hatred, racial divide, anger, um, looting and burning, destruction, uh, and especially our larger cities. And it's just continuing. Now, we want to see the fire come down, but we want it to be God's fire that comes down and not the fire of destruction. And so one would ask, well, what in the world, what in the world is going on? I mean, we expected to see, uh, after Pentecost, a tremendous blessing. Where's our blessing? You know, these, these are good questions to ask. The Bible says the curse causeless does not come. And what we're seeing right now in America is worse than the plague. We're seeing destruction. Hey, okay, well, there's a cause. I want to talk to you um, about a couple of cities. And I'm going to, don't worry, I'm going to tie some things together for you so you can have a biblical idea of where we're at in America today. Let me preface it with this scripture so that we can tie it back. I'm going to go to Zechariah chapter 2. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. Okay, Zechariah. It's over in the Minor Prophets in most Bibles after um, Haggai. And we are in chapter 2. And the prophet writes, Then I raised my eyes and looked, behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. And so I said, Where are you going? And he said to me, To measure Jerusalem, to see what is the width and what is the length. And it describes a, a little bit about Jerusalem, how God's going to protect Jerusalem. Verse 8, it says, For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the Lord of angel armies, He sent me after glory to the nations which plunder you. He's coming after the nations that plunder Israel. Did you hear that? For he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. Those who touch Israel are touching the apple of God's eye. In other words, you don't like it. It upsets him. For surely in verse 9, I will shake my hand against them, and they shall become spoil for their servants or those who used to be their servants, their slaves. Then you will know that I am the Lord God. If you touch the apple of his eye, even those who used to be your slaves will turn against you. What do we see in the streets right now? See, we're, we're linking the anger and rage and riots that we're seeing in the street right now. We're linking that to the death, the unjust death of a black man by the name of Floyd. It was unjust, and, and there's a right for people to grieve the loss of that man who was begging on his face, please let me breathe. Terrible. And justice will prevail. But there's something more going on here. That's just not the only issue. And so I want to open kind of a bigger vision for you to see the greater issue. Go with me to Joel chapter 2. We're in the Minor Prophets. So you're just going to go back a little bit. Just after Daniel and Hosea, we come to Joel. 
And of course, Joel chapter 2, this, this is the chapter where we see the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and uh, your sons and daughters will prophesy. Now look at chapter 3. For behold, in those days, and at the time when I bring back the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. And I will enter into judgment with them there. Why? On account of my people, my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations, and they've also divided my land. I've mentioned this before, but we need we need a um, a better view of it. January the twenty ninth, twenty eighth. We were sitting on the greatest economy that America has ever enjoyed, largely because America recognized in two thousand eighteen Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and fought off all the other nations at the UN and said, no, we're standing with her. And God blessed us so tremendously. Our stock market went through the roof. Our unemployment numbers hit way lower than they've ever been in history. We began to prosper as a nation. But something happened on January 28th that changed everything. The announcement of the deal of the century by our administration, which is a land for, for peace effort, and a map that's being created, the prosperity map. And so, you know, basically what the Palestinians have been told is that if you will agree for this, some of the land where the Jews have settlements in the West Bank, Judea, Samaria, Israel will annex those. The 70% that's left over will go to you to be a part of your new state. And the Palestinians didn't agree with that. They want the pre-67 borders. They want all of it. And, in fact, they're not really interested in peace. They want to just take everything, including Jerusalem. And they want all the Jews out. The places where they are totally in control of a city, they don't allow Jews to be there. They don't want any Jews in the biblical heartland of Judea and Samaria. And so when this was announced, the very next day, the World Health Organization announced the pandemic. And there was a worldwide crisis. And then all of a sudden, fear came in. Now, the percentage of death Right, for those who get the coronavirus, just above 3%. Way lower than any other pandemic we've ever had and lower than the flu numbers. More people are dying of the flu than our coronavirus. Now, it's sad because people are losing their lives. And those who are especially uh, vulnerable, those who are older in age um, or poor health, they're not doing well, and they need to be protected. But instead of having a measured response, and they do that anyway, like with the flu and, and pneumonia and all that, instead of having a measured response to it, it shut down the economy, and our economy began to fall and be destroyed. Friends, this all relates to what we're doing to Israel and the lack of peace you know, it's called, it's called um, a map for peace, prosperity. No, it's a map for destruction. Because any time you begin to try to give away the lands of Israel, what you're doing is you're causing Israel to break covenant with God. And when you do that, then you receive judgment. Let me give you an, in, an indication. Um <clears throat> It, it was decided with one of these peace negotiations that Gaza Strip would be given back to the Palestinians and all the Jews would leave. And there were a lot of Jews there. And they had great, wonderful businesses. When the last Jew left Gaza Strip, 
Hurricane Katrina hit America and New Orleans. Coincidence, right? No. 1991, George Bush Sr. got up at the Madrid Peace Conference, Land for Peace. He got up to speak about it. There was, at that time, a hurricane going up the eastern seaboard, and that hurricane was called Hurricane Grace. It wasn't doing a lot, but when he got up to speak, a super storm arose out of nowhere. They didn't even have a chance to name it. They just called it the perfect storm. It swallowed up all the grace. It headed out to sea like it was going to leave, turned around, made a complete turnabout, and came back and hit Kenny Bunkport, Maine, his hometown, and destroyed his house. Coincidence, right? Not a coincidence. God said, you're touching the apple of my eye. You touch the apple of my eye, I'll touch the apple of your eye. You love your retirement home in Kenny Bunkport? Try this on. Folks, do you understand <coughs> that on July 1st, the Knesset votes to annex those Jewish communities in Judea, Samaria, at the same time they're voting to give away the 70%. They're agreeing to negotiate with the Palestinians for that. And they've already agreed with Trump that they'll do it. Better watch your calendar. If that vote goes down and they say yes, and, you know, when I first looked at it, I said, well, yay, they're going to get, you know, all those Jewish communities under, they're going to be annexed and under Jewish sovereignty. That's part way, man, of getting the West Bank back. But I didn't realize until I looked at it closer. It also means giving away of 70% of Judea Samaria, which is covenant land, and God will react and respond because you're touching the apple of his eye. You know, he sent the prophet Nineveh to Nineveh, the prophet Jonah, and he didn't want to go. He didn't want to lift up his voice against them because he thought, you know, I know God. I know Yahweh. He is the God of mercy and justice. And if I preach to them and they begin to repent, he's going to spare them. He knew how wicked and evil they were. He didn't want them spared. He wanted them destroyed. So you know the story. The prophet ran. Boy, did he run. And he got on the ship headed for Tarshish. You read about this in the book of Jonah. He went way down to the basement where nobody could see him, where it was dark, curled up, went to sleep, and said, I'm just going to have me a good rest. Well, a violent storm came up. They began to toss the ship. And so they knew they were in deep trouble. They started throwing cargo overboard, and the, it, the ocean just got worse. When God calls you to speak out on something, especially if you're a prophet, and you don't, not only do you go through difficult times, you cause other people to go through difficult times. As a prophetic people, we have to lift our voices. We have to speak out. And so finally the ship captain asked, well, where, where's the guy we were bringing with us, the extra guy? So they found him asleep, and so the captain came down there and said, Hey, get up. Don't you know that we're in danger of, of sinking? We're asking every man on board, call upon his God, whoever it is. You need to get up and call upon your God. So he went up there with the rest of them, and he knew what was wrong. So they cast lots with the idea of, show us what man among us is the cause of this storm. And the lot fell against, guess who, Jonah. And they said, okay, confess. Fess up. He said, I'm, I'm the cause. Well, then what should we do about it that this might stop? If you throw me overboard, the storm will stop. So 
they, they tried not to do that at first. They tried to row and correct things and, and get the boat through it. It just got worse. They said, well, what are you going to do? So they picked him up. Sorry, guy. Whoop. Plunk. Into the water. And it says God had prepared a huge fish. I don't know if we're talking a whale or what, but it swallowed him. And so he's in there for three days before he repented. He had a hard heart, didn't he? It took him three days. <laughs> Couldn't have spelt nice in there. <laughs> His head was wrapped with seaweed. Partial things that that animal had eaten were in the process of dissolving in acid and decaying. It was not a good place for a fish dinner. <laughs> And so he finally repented and gave praise and gave thanks to God. I'm going to be honest with you. Had he gone to Nineveh without having his heart right, he wouldn't have been effective. He couldn't go there with a hard heart. He had to go there with God's mercy and God's grace. So God caused the fish to vomit him out on the land. Now, in that part of the world, they believed that the gate of hell was in the ocean. So if you went in there and didn't come back, well, you went to hell. If you went in and got out, God did a miracle. He showed you favor. You got God's favor. So can you imagine there, there are people who see this great fish come up, what a sight on the beach, and vomit him out, head still wrapped in seaweed. Like, man, who are you? What, what? So he told them. And then he began to head towards Nineveh. But the people are bringing the word of this guy who had the favor of the gods and had been delivered from the mouth of the fish. And this wild story is spreading before he gets to Nineveh. That's why they react so quickly. And, and he tells them, listen. There's much wickedness. And the, their wickedness included a lot of bloodshed and violence. And the sacrificing of babies, temple prostitutes. And guess what the chief goddess was of Nineveh? The goddess Estar, for which we call Easter. And they would come to the temple visit the prostitutes on this given day, which is now what they use for Easter. And it commemorated the fact that her son, Tammuz, supposedly was killed by a wild boar. And she resurrected him from the dead. And then they had, a, after 40 days, they had a celebration. They had a sunrise service celebration. They worshipped Baal, the sun. And each year, they would impregnate the, the prostitutes. And somewhere time during the year, nine months later, they would have babies. And so the babies would be kept until it was time for the next celebration on Easter. They would kill the babies and take their blood. And her symbol was the rabbit and eggs. So they would dip the eggs in the blood of the babies. They would go hide them, and the father and children would go have Estar egg hunt. And then they would have a ham dinner because it celebrated the defeating of the boar when, they, when she caused Tammuz to be resurrected. Now, hook and sinker. Christian churches today... Koch Blanche are using all of this and, and they're what they call their Easter service. It's, it's the same word for Eshtar. It's just a transliteration of it. So when you say we're going to have an Easter egg hunt, we're going to have a, an Easter service, it may mean something different for you, but what it means to God and, and who it honors is it honors not our God. It honors the goddess Eshtar. And, and so they would have kept that celebration 
almost exactly the same way that Christians are keeping it today. Come. Easter egg hunt, hiding the eggs, coloring them, um, having an early Sunday sunrise service followed by a ham dinner. Can you see how the devil has brought paganism into the church and God looks at it and says, I need my church to come out of Babylon, thank you, that you be not partakers of her plagues. And so all of these things are in view when we talk about the evil of Nineveh. Now, Nineveh is currently located today in what we would call uh, Mosul, Mosul um, Iraq. There's still a city there. And so the prophet was sent there, and he preached. And he said, in 40 days, this city will be destroyed. Now, guess what else was happening? At the same time he went there to preach, Abraham was sent to investigate Sodom. Also sexual sins. Now, there wasn't enough people that were willing to repent in Sodom. They got destroyed. But Nineveh got a reprieve because they repented. From the king on down, with sackcloth and ashes, they repented. And I believe that happened because the prophet went there having experienced God's mercy, which he didn't deserve, and God's grace, and it softened him enough to go give the message. But then after he gave the message, he gets to thinking to himself, you know what, this is not going to wind up good for me. I preach that they're going to be destroyed. God's going to turn from that destruction. They're not going to be destroyed. I'm going to have an egg on my face, and I'm going to look terrible as a prophet. And so he goes out in the wilderness and sits down and becomes depressed. He said, I just want to die. God had mercy on him. So God caused overnight this wonderful plant grew up. I don't know if it had a flower or something on it, but something that caused shade. And it gave him comfort and shade. And it said it pleased the prophet. But then overnight, he sent a worm. And a worm destroyed the plant. So the next day, the prophet's like, well, how could this happen? This was such a wonderful, beautiful plant giving shade and blessing me. How, how could this happen? And God said, listen to me, prophet. If you can mourn over the loss of of this simple plant why and, and show compassion for it, why can you not share the same kind of compassion for this people? So he exposed his heart. He still had prejudice and hatred towards the Ninevite people. And, and so God wants to, to speak to us about that, folks. How can we pray for what's going on if we have hatred and anger in our hearts? Whether it's against the police, people of color, minorities, um, government. There's just a lot of rage and anger going on. That all has to come to God and be taken away. Now, you remember uh, how Moses... came to Mount Sinai with the children of Israel, and God came down in a cloud with fire, and he's going to give them the, the, um, the Ten Commandments and the instructions. And he called out of the cloud to Moses and told him to come to him. So Moses entered the cloud. But he didn't immediately go into God's presence. You know what it says? After he entered the cloud, he had to wait six days to be cleansed. So here's Moses. He's on the mountain somewhere. He's in the cloud. But he has to stop for six days because his heart has to be cleansed before he can enter the presence of the living God. Now, I can tell you, we need to enter the presence of the living God. 
Now, Friday, you all know that we had a, 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 a large strawberry red moon Friday, yesterday. And whenever they fall on a particular Jewish day that has a meaning, it's God pointing to the meaning of that day saying, I'm speaking to you. So what was Friday? Savan, S-I-V-A-N. Savan 13. What was that? That was the day after Moses had spent six days being cleansed. That was the day he finally entered the presence of God. The anger had been taken. All the way back to the slave he killed. All the way back to the times of... The Israelites grumbled and complained and didn't follow his leadership and upset it. All that had to come out before he could intercede for the people. What's God saying to us? You want to take your cities? It's time to get on the mountain with him in his presence and let him cleanse your hearts. Listen, the church needs to start being the church, as Apostle Homer said earlier in our, the introduction of our service. But to be the church, we've got to empty from ourselves all of the things that we're seeing in the street. Then we need to come into the presence of the living God, and we need to intervene in prayer and ask for mercy and for grace. Now, what the prophet discovered was righteousness by faith and how you apply it to a city. When you apply it to a city, you don't do it in anger. When you apply it to a city, you come to the city with mercy and God's grace and his love, and you address the city. Here's, we've seen some glimpses of it. We've seen police officers that are ready to be challenged by a mob, and they get on their knees and start praying for them, and then the mob is on their knees. We've seen them put arms around each other and pray. We've seen some examples of Righteous by faith. You know, justice without mercy and grace is not justice. Thump people down. Put them under control. Let us get all the fire hoses out and just blast them. No, justice is not justice if it lacks mercy and grace. It's not God's. And so there has to be the mingling of the two. And we need to pray, church, that the leaders will begin to understand that violence for violence is not the solution. The Bible says in uh, the book of Psalms that in Christ, mercy and grace, mercy and justice kissed each other at the cross. They have to come together. We see a good picture of what this is supposed to look like when we see Christ sending the 70 in Luke chapter 10. And he says, look, guys, look, boys, here's the plan that you're going to follow. If I'm going to come to the city, you're going to pray for all the families in the city, or I won't come there. And once you pray for them, minister healing to them. Then tell them about the kingdom. Do you see the order? Now, if you tell them about the kingdom, you're telling them about sin, how he died for them and took their sin, sharing the gospel. But he didn't start there. He said, first, I want you to show them the mercy and grace things. I want you to pray for them and then go minister to them. If anybody's sick in the house, eat whatever they set before you. But if anybody's sick in the house... Minister to them. Pray for them. And then when I touch them, tell them about the justice part. About how I died for them. To forgive them. But first, show them my kindness and my love. Show them my grace. Heal them. Now you can read about it. It's in Luke chapter 10. The mercy and grace comes first. It's like the opposite of what's happening in the streets. We need to pray that there'll be a reversal of the order and the hearts of our leaders will be changed 
to have the correct view of justice. Justice without mercy and grace is not justice. And we need to continue to pray for Israel. I'll be on a conference call this Sunday where we'll be addressing and praying for not only what's getting ready to happen in Israel, they've made a map. It's called the prosperity map because what they promised the Palestinians is if they go along with this, they will have great prosperity restored to them and there will be peace. Well, they're good to it. But be- when it's voted and accepted by at least the Jews at our urging, our prosperity will cease again. Judgment will come again. I that for us or for Israel, because it will also happen to Israel. Those of you that are listening, it's time to pray. It's time to pray for Israel and our nation that we will not touch the apple of his eye and bring them harm. Those who bless Israel are blessed, but those who bring the breaking of covenant to Israel, they will be judged. Am I making it plain? Is Is it clear to you what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, we're living in a moment in history that we're either going to see a turn that's going to bring great prosperity and great blessings or massive destruction judgment. Father in heaven, we pause now to lift up what's happening with Israel because everything's flowing out of that. We repent, representing the church, We repent for our leaders, O God. I know that their hearts, which are trying to somehow bring peace, a lasting peace, they're not realizing what I've spoken today. And so the motives were to try to bring uh, prosperity and peace, but because they misunderstand covenant, they have caused a breaking of covenant with Israel. Forgive us as a nation. Forgive our leaders. And Father, I ask today that you'll hold back your hand, that the violence and the riots and the destruction upon our cities, Father God, I I ask for you to demonstrate your mercy and grace. The church is beginning to pray and repent. And you said when the dedication of Solomon's temple in Second Chronicles chapter 6, if your people, even while they are in foreign lands, will turn and remember the city which the temple was dedicated and remember the covenant promises that you made, that you would hear from heaven and intervene for them. And you even included plagues in the description. And so, Father, we are invoking that promise. We we pray for the peace of Jerusalem and Israel. We pray for covenant alignment. And we pray, Father, between now and July 1st, that you move upon the leaders and the Knesset and others to see the importance of covenant and not following along with the idea of giving covenant land away. Father, we we love our president. We love our country. But we want to humble ourselves before you and ask, O God, that you'll cleanse our hearts and that you'll teach us of your grace and your mercy so that justice will be a blessing. And so, Father, I pray across America, others will begin to hear this message. And even this Sunday, as as many will be online praying, that you will turn our course of action 
And Father, we will not be moving into a greater judgment, but a season of restoration. Because you are a God of mercy, and you do hear when your people humble themselves, turn from their wicked ways, seek your face. You said you will forgive their sin and heal their land. I'm asking today, Heavenly Father, that you will forgive our sins, which are many, regarding all of these things today. And that you will heal our land and that of Israel. And I do pray for lasting peace in Israel, but the type of peace that you will bring, that not of man. Perhaps Israel will be encouraged to rise up and vote to annex the land that they believe they should have at this time without agreeing to giving away biblical land. Because I think they could do it and America would not get in the way. So, Father, we put all this now at your throne. And we ask that you bless us now. Send and release your angel armies. And we pray for wisdom and guidance for our leaders and the leaders of Israel. That we might live in peace. Thank you now on the Shabbat we pray. Amen.